Hello, my name is Dr. Ed Shahady, and we're here at the Cardiometabolic Risk Summit in Las Vegas, and I'm joined here by Dr. Sandra Taylor, and Dr. Taylor is a nephrologist, and she's a professor of medicine at uh, Mayo Clinic Rochester, and she was involved with the creation of the JNC-8 guidelines, which we're all familiar with as primary care practitioners. Sandra, I'll just ask you, you know, there's some, some of the recommendations that created the controversy, and I'm sure you all thought about that and everything. Well, one of the ones I have the most difficulty with is if you're over age 60, it's recommended that your systolic can go up to 150, whereas before, I was treating all those people. 140 was my, my top, and in some cases, 130. So would you help us understand the rationale and how we deal with that uh, conflict right. within ourselves? Right. So this was an evidence-based document, and to derive each part of the guideline, we looked at the evidence uh, in terms of heart outcomes, cardiovascular events, kidney failure, death, and whether a treatment or a blood pressure target made right. a difference in reducing the right. number of those events. And whether it's surprising to you or not, there really is no evidence from trials right. to support a lower blood pressure target right. than right. less than 150. Mm -hmm. So 150 is still too high. Uh -huh. One 40s uh, is okay, and I think that many practitioners probably do tolerate mm -hmm. somebody coming in with an office blood pressure in the 140s uh -huh. and say that's okay. Mm -hmm. And really this guideline justifies that. It right. says that's what the data shows. Uh -huh. And in addition, there's the corollary mm -hmm. to the first uh, recommendation. Right. And the corollary says that if somebody's blood pressure is less than 140, they're over age 60 and they're doing fine, you can leave them alone. Right. So there's no really, really requirement that you need to go up or back off on their therapy. Okay. What if they have additional morbidities? What if they're hypertensive, they have lipid issues, they're diabetic? Does that make me want to change the number? Well, the guideline is different for a diabetic, mm -hmm. regardless of age, or somebody with chronic kidney disease, mm -hmm. whether it's from diabetes or something else. Okay. And for those individuals, the target is less than 140 and less than 90 for mm -hmm. systolic and diastolic, right. and it doesn't matter how old they are. Okay. Now, those targets are higher than the targets in JNC7, which yes. was less than 130 systolic and less right. than 80 diastolic, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and again, that's based on the evidence, and in fact, there isn't even evidence to support 140 over 90 mm -hmm. for people with chronic kidney disease, mm -hmm. but the committee did not feel comfortable right. raising that to a higher level. Well, the ADA has a different guideline. They suggest if you're diabetic that we shoot for 140 over 80. They did bump it from 130 to 180. One, or 130 to 140, 140. Yes. yes. But they left the diastolic at 80, so how do, we, how do we deal with that? Right, and that diastolic of 80 is based on a post hoc analysis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the um, 2014 guideline that I was part of yes. uh, was not, did not include post hoc analyses. Mm -hmm. The data is pretty weak for that. Mm -hmm. So I, and, and then the other thing is that most individuals with diabetes will have more trouble with their systolic pressure mm -hmm. than their diastolic. So I don't know how much of an issue it really is, especially as people get older. Right. Probably more, there's the guideline and then what we see. So as right. people get older, it's not unusual to see a 60s and 70s diastolic, diastolic with a higher, exactly. higher systolic. Exactly. Okay, very good. What, now let's talk about treatment. And I know that, that the, the guidelines do say, okay, if you have a black patient, you have a diabetic patient. So could you give us some advice on that? Yeah. How I should approach my patients based on race or disease? <laughs> Yeah, so this guideline really liberalizes your choices, okay. where with JNC7, it was recommended that everybody be treated with a thiazide-type diuretic first. Now we're saying it could be a thiazide-type diuretic, an ACE inhibitor, or an angiotensin receptor blocker, or a calcium channel blocker. Mm -hmm. Now, the data, mainly from all hat, showed mm -hmm. that in black patients, they didn't have the same benefit from a single agent of an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker. Mm -hmm. So there, the guideline recommends starting with a thiazide-type diuretic right. or a calcium channel blocker. Right. The, the 
dilemma in some people's minds is related to chronic kidney disease. Let's say mm -hmm. I have a black patient with chronic kidney disease, mm -hmm. and for chronic kidney disease, you're recommending an ACE inhibitor yes. or an angiotensin receptor blocker. Right. And there, you know, it's likely, especially in somebody with right. chronic kidney disease, that they're going to require more than one medication. Yes. So you can really meet both of the, the recommendation, you know, parts. You can use a thiazide diuretic or a calcium channel blocker, and you can add an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker, and you may need more medication on top of that. So mm -hmm. I don't think it's as complicated as right. maybe it looks on the surface. Okay, you know, it's a different what have you. Now, it's in diabetics, I think we've always felt, or well, I think we've been taught, you know, you start with an ACE or an R because that's going to protect the kidneys. Is that still a good rule of thumb, or now we Only go with... Only if the, they have some evidence for chronic kidney disease. Okay. So, and it doesn't take much. It could be microalbuminuria. Right, right. An elevated urine microalbumin would right. be enough. I'd mm -hmm. say yes. Mm -hmm. But if they don't have that, you know, there were patients being started on an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin receptor blocker who didn't have hypertension or microalbuminuria, and we're really saying there's just no evidence for that. Yeah, that was my next question, because yes. I'll, I'll hear at meetings often, I get asked the question, where do you put them on an ACE inhibitor, although they're not hypertensive, right. or they don't I have microalbuminuria? Yeah. Right, and that's yeah. somehow, I, I remember one internist friend, so we were taught that, of course, it was some time ago, but now if they don't have hypertension or microalbuminuria, and they're diabetic, there's no indication for an ACE inhibitor. Exactly, and I wanted to point out that there are other guidelines mm -hmm in the world of nephrology that have also raised the blood pressure right. goal right. to 140 over 90. So even though the American Diabetes Association mm -hmm. has kept the 80, um, KDGO, which is uh -huh. an international nephrology group, yes. has chosen 140 over 90 mm -hmm. unless they have proteinuria. Right. And they've kept the lower goal in that case, but right. again, without evidence. Yeah, as you're mentioning that, I, I recall reading they have that heat diagram as I look at a patient, is their GFR goes through, you know, goes down if they have a right. GFR, say they're 3B and, and they're hypertensive and they is. have protein, that I want to be more aggressive. And, it, and that's to prevent cardiovascular disease, is that correct? It's probably to prevent cardiovascular disease and kidney disease, okay. but it's without evidence. Okay. Again. Just expert opinion. Ep expert opinion, some post hoc follow up studies that okay. lost people in between the original study and the follow up okay. study. Okay, well, great. Yeah. Very valuable information. I'm looking forward to your presentation here in a few minutes. Thanks for Thank being you. with us, Sandra. Thank you. All right.